So okay. So let's consider go back to saturation. So when we had an NMOS and saturation. And this was VDS, right? So in saturation, what is the condition for saturation? VDS should be greater than VGS minus VT. All right. So VDS is greater than VGS minus VT. Right? That's not equal to that point where it's equal, VDSAP is also in saturation. So at that point, right, in the ideal MOSFET, we said IDS is given by half mu and C ox W by L into VGS minus VT, the whole square, right? So in saturation, IDS and independent of VDS, and therefore we said in saturation, this looks like a current source. Now in reality, there in reality, however, one of the first models where we break the square law is known as what what we discussed was channel length modulation. So in channel length modulation, what happens is IDS is no longer independent of VDS. So for example, if you remember the output characteristics of the transistor, right? Our output characteristics in the square law look like this. So till this point, which is your VDSAT, The ID VDS relationship was initially linear, then became parabolic, and beyond VDSAT, it was a constant. Now, in reality, however, the ID VD relationship and saturation looks something like this. That is, IDS is proportional to VDS. That is, as I increase VDS, I get more and more current. Right? And so this we looked in ED is primarily because of the fact that the effective channel length of the transistor reduces. But for us in this class, what it means is essentially IDS can now be written in saturation as half mu and C ox W by L VGS minus VT, the whole square into one plus lambda VDS. And so again, remember, this is a model physically this is, does not have a meaning. The, the reason we use this model is this model approximates the behavior of the transistor very well for most nodes, right? This term, lambda, is known as the channel length modulation parameter. Right? So what we see, therefore, is that the current, therefore, now, now if you consider uh, the MOSFET and saturation, right? What can you tell me now? What can you tell me the model of this MOSFET would look like? What what happens because of channel and saturation? What does this transistor look like in saturation? So it looks like uh, like uh, current dependent, voltage dependent current source. No, so yeah. in this case, we model the, we said that here, IDS is independent of VDS, right? And so we said that at the output, this looks like a current source where the current is only proportional to VGS minus VT, the whole square, right? So similarly here, the way we model this, what does this mean? What So what does this, uh, this continues to be the current source, but what is happening because of VDS? So because of VDS, what is happening is, if you think about the current source of the transistor, right? This is your drainage source. Now, the current flowing through this transistor, unfortunately, is a function of VDS, right? So we see that we now begin to look like an imperfect current source. So what happens because of this is, this we will model it as an imperfect current source. Right? So the way we do it is we'll put in some resistor R0 in parallel with it, telling us that this is essentially going to model this relationship. 
right? And so from that you can ask, so what you're seeing therefore is that the transistor and saturation continues to behave like a current source, only thing it is not an ideal current source, but it is in fact an imperfect current source. And we model it similar to how we model imperfect current sources, basically with a resistor in parallel. Right? So let's look at some other, let's revisit some other device uh, parameters and then we'll come back to modeling. So let's, for example, let's do one quick question uh, to highlight this point. So let me assume, so this is a uh, problem, assume in saturation. IDS is 1 milliamp at BDS is equal to 0.5 volts. So suppose IDS is given to be 1 milliamp, right? Question given to you is if lambda is equal to 0.1, what is the value of IDS at VDS equal to one min, one volt? What are the units of uh, lambda? What are the units of lambda? Volt in volt. Volt in volt. So how do you calculate this? So since the half mu and Cox part is essentially constant, we can just uh, divide the two equations and we get a direct sure. relationship. Sure. It's I think one divided by one point zero five. Good. That's very simple, right? I mean, it's basically IDS is proportional to one plus lambda VDS, right? So we have IDS one by IDS two is equal to 1 plus lambda VDS1 by 1 plus lambda VDS2. Right? And so you know IDS1 is 1 milliamp, VDS1 is 0.5, VDS2 is 1 volt. From that, you can calculate what IDS2 is. Right? Now, if I ask you the next question, what is the output resistance of this transistor? How would you calculate that? So what does the output resistance mean? That is, if I if I look at it at the output node, that is across the drain and source, what is the resistance? Or what is the uh, apparent resistance I see of the circuit? So how would I calculate that? Uh, VDS by IDS. Is it VDS by IDS or is it delta VDS by delta IDS is the question. That's delta VDS. Delta VDS. Right. So, and, and you should remember that from here. So, if you remember the IDVD characteristics, right. So, if I do ID by, so remember I'm in these two, suppose I'm in these two points in saturation, right. So, I want to calculate what is the apparent resistance shown by this transistor, right. So therefore, the apparent resistance to the transistor, if I do ID by VDS, I'm going to plot, I'm going to calculate the slope of this, this line, which is not a physical line, right, if I calculate ID by VD. So R0 of the output resistance is nothing but delta VDS by delta IDS, right. So that is the slope of this graph. So that is the apparent resistance that is shown by this transistor at its output node. Are you following me? And so if I want this to be close to ideal, what should the value of R0 be? Zero. So if I want my R0 to be, if I want my current source to be close to ideal, what should the value of R0 be? So infinity. Very good, right? Infinity. So for an ideal current source, R0 should be infinity, implies what should lambda be? Zero. 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 Right? And so now this is 
important. So again, if you remember the square law, when lambda is zero, things look nice and fine. Now, as I reduce the gate length of the transistor, what happens to the value of lambda? Does it increase, remain the same, decrease? If I reduce the gate length of the transistor, what happens to the value of lambda? So lambda would increase, right? And what is the reason behind it? You are correct. And why would it increase? So because then the pinch off point moves closer to the drain, right? Mm. So lambda, so delta L by L. Remember, lambda is proportional to delta L by L. If you remember lectures in ED, right? When you are in saturation, right? If lambda is coming about because of the fact that in saturation, as you increase your VES, you start seeing this delta L. The point pinch off point moves in, right? Now, in the square law, what we say is delta L by this total gate length of the transistor is very small. And so we neglect that effect. So we say that even as VDS increases, the effective gate length of the channel continues to remain LG. However, as you reduce the gate length, right, this, this delta L becomes a larger and larger part of your delta LG. Right? So as your gate length reduces, your LG lambda increases. And so what happens to R0 then in that case? So if my lambda increases, what happens to R0? So R0 decreases. R0 will decrease. So what is happening therefore is, as technology scales, as you go from node to node, as you scale down, remember all of you should be aware the transistor scaling is essentially reducing the gate length. Right? So every new node, then you work in technology, the gate length is reducing. So which means you're, you're starting to make imperfect transistors. So today we work in the region of imperfect transistors. So R0 is a reality, you have to deal with it. So ideally for analog design, when you want current sources, you want to ensure that you find a transistor whose R0 is as high as possible as you can get. So in normal cases, when you have analog design, and this is I'm talking about 15 years back or 10 years ago, or if you work in old technologies, normally what happens is that you have a choice of lengths. So uh, a technology will allow you to use transistors of various gate lengths. So when various when gate lengths, suppose tomorrow I give you a technology where I'm saying L can vary between 0.5 micron and 3 micron. So if I give you that, I can support any of these gate lengths in the technology. And if I ask you, design a transistor which gives me a perfect current source, which L would you pick? 3 micron. 3 micron. Right? So remember, in analog design, generally, we tend to bias ourselves towards larger lengths. Right? And the reason is because those transistors tend to be better behaved, closer to the square law than scale transistors. Now the drawback is that, what is the drawback of using large transistors? Can you think of one or two drawbacks or at least one drawback? So you can't fit more of them on the same chip. Area, right? So basically analog design therefore consumes a lot area. Now the good part about analog design is generally in SOC design, analog, consume, analog by itself is a small part of design. Most of the design area is consumed by memory. So you don't have to worry about spending a lot of area on design. But it is important, therefore, to remember that analog design, there is a lot of emphasis on transistor behavior. If I, when, when you do digital design next semester in ADVD, you realize that there, when we think about the device as a switch, optimization becomes different. Whereas in analog design, you want the entire characteristics of the transistor to be exactly what you expect them to be. Right? And so this flexibility of using large gate lengths used to be something which a design engineer had say you know even as late as five years back or something what has happened of late is as the technology scaling has speeded what has happened is that gate lengths have gone into the sub 20 nanometer regime or 20 30 nanometer regime so in that regime you can't a technology guy will not be able to support these multiple gate lengths for you so then you end up having problems where you have to design an analog circuit with really poor transistors. So you'll see, therefore, that analog design continues to be, be, be a lot in demand because every new technology requires a new uh, approach to design because it, it might be possible that the old design will absolutely fail in the current technology. And, and the, 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 I would say, 
hence there is a lot of demand for analog design but also because of that analog design is a pain in the behind simply because it you'd have to be very careful a lot of parameters need need to be taken into consideration when you're doing optimization and design okay so let's talk about one more parameter which will be important in analog design which is transconductance right or gm and what is gm gm is defined by remember transconductance right so we talk about input output relationship so gm is nothing but the rate of change of id for a change in vgs at a constant vds right so the gm is nothing but what is the change in id i can get for a change in vgs for a given vds right and so in saturation so again let's assume square law assume square law so in saturation what is the value of gm id is given by half km prime w by l vgs minus vt the whole square into 1 plus lambda vds okay. so if i want to find gm gm is do id by do vgs at a constant vds right so the two comes out here two cancels here so you get kn prime w by l vgs minus vt so what you see here therefore is gm it's important here if we look at uh, So GM is proportional to VG minus VT. So the overdrive, and this is not known as the overdrive of the transistor. That is, it's a measure of how much the transistor is turned on beyond the threshold voltage, right? So the transconductance of the amplifier can be increased either by increasing the size of the amplifier, size of the transistor, or by increasing the overdrive of the transistor. And we can also substitute back for PGS by VT, and we can write GM as square root of 2 mu n C ox W by L ID. So there again, it means that suppose I have a given ID in saturation, then my GM is proportional to the square root of ID. And the third expression, which we'll all use sometimes is Again, these are all the same expressions. The reason I'm bringing these three, and these three are very common that we use a lot in design, simply because many a times you don't have, you have flexibility in choosing only one or the other. So depending on what are the uh, circuit parameters you can change, based on that, you can design the circuit used in each of these formulas, right? So, Again, they're all based on the same, but what you see is essentially GM, and this is again an important relationship. GM is completely controlled by what is the drive current and the overdrive. Right? So drive, so higher the drive current, uh, you get a higher GM. Right? So therefore, and why is GM important? We look at it uh, in this class on the next. The GM is directly related to the gain of the transistor. Right? So you normally, if you want a particular signal gain, you want to go with the transistor which gives you a high gm and so you can get that high gm by either increasing the size of the transistor or by pushing a lot more current through the transistor okay. so for completeness sake we'll also talk about body effect so can you show the slide once more uh, so, how did you get the second equation for the transconductance? Substitute VGS minus VT, substituted from the IDS expression, remove 1 plus lambda VTS. So, many a times in this class, what we do is we will not use this for more. So, what happens in most times, most of the time, lambda VTS is going to be much smaller than 1. So, we're going to neglect that with respect. Uh, we're going to neglect that with respect to uh the other terms when we do the dc analysis I, i'll get you uh, we, we do all that when we do examples in class so when you do when you're going from this expression this expression basically replace vgs and vt as a function of id removing these 
lambda VDF term, and then you get these two. Okay, so thank you. Sir, I have a question. Mm. So would you say that the transconductance is directly proportional or indirectly to VGS minus VT? <laughs> Hold on to that. So it depends on what is the constant term. So that's why I said uh, you, depending on what is constant, you base it off that. What are the freedom degrees of, see, design is all about, you have certain degrees of freedom and you have to pick two. Right? For example, many times what happens is you will have the option of changing the VGS minus VT, say, using some other uh, voltage technique. So in that case, then you'll have to pick what is the right VGS minus VT for a given amplifier gain. Right? So there you can pick either using the first formula or the second formula. Whether you pick one or the other will be dependent on, okay, what is the ID you can tolerate? Say I gave a power envelope to you. Then that will give you a maximum ID. So then from that, you can back up it and see. When you do more examples, you'll understand. Right now, uh, I'm just giving you the different expressions. When you start doing design, you, you, you'll you start developing the uh, intuition as to what to use where. Okay. Can I go to the next slide? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Let's talk about body effect. Right. So remember, in reality, a transistor has four terminals, right? We have the gate, source, drain, and we have the body term. And if you remember in your transistor cartoon, right? So in normally in most cases, we will ground the body and substrate together. So in most cases, substrate and body are tied together in which case you don't have an issue. In the case where the body and substrate are not tied together, then you end up having a change in VT. So if there is a bias present between the source and body, you get a change in VT. So the new VT is given by VTH at zero plus gamma times square root of two phi F plus VSP minus square root of 2 pi. Right? So remember this expression, all this means is that in the cases where your source and body are not tied together, you have to model that using a change in VT. Okay? And this term is known as the body effect parameter gamma. Typically, you know, it's 0.2, 0.3. So 0.2 to 0.3, and the unit is square root of 4. Again, we will not obsess ourselves too much in this class because we're doing the first class analog design. But when we do ADBD, we will come back to this. So remember that in most cases, either we will in, ignore the body effect in case the body and the source are not tied together. So we'll assume that gamma is equal to zero in that case, or We'll always assume that the body and substrate are tied together, source are tied together. Right? So in this class, you don't have to worry about the effect of gamma. But remember, in reality, gamma is a real effect. Right? Now again, impact of gamma is important in planar transistors. When you start working in FinFET and nanowire and nano shade designs, then uh, body effect doesn't exist in fully depleted devices. So uh, again, this is something which is vestigial of the long channel planar transistors that we've had. And uh, hence for completeness, I've put it here. But again, in pinfet designs, we won't really use this. Uh, so in the real world, you're not going to be using this most of the time. So I have a doubt. Yeah. Like, would you risk having a current flow from source to body is my doubt. Like why even bias it if you have going to run into no it won't it won't be a question of biasing many a times this is dictated by layout so i think for that you have to do a vlsi design class so once you do a vlsi design we talk about layout etc then you'll begin to understand why there is a sub bias between the body and substrate yes. it won't be real clear right now if i just draw the circle ideally you don't want that but many a times you have to live with that because that's how unfortunately layout works so it's more of an unwanted effect. Now, people have figured that um, like 20 years ago that we can use this to electrically change the VTH. 
So a lot of digital designs, we use this to modulate VTH. But again, all this, you know, last five, six years, nobody uses this in FinFET models. But, so in the old technologies, people continue to use it. But in uh, none of the latest technologies, we don't really worry about the body a lot. Okay. The last thing I want to remind you guys about is sub-threshold conduction. What I mean by that is when VGS is less than VT, right? We essentially said that IDS is zero. In reality, that is not the case. IDS is a small quantity. So if I plot log of IDS, should remember this from ED, the plot log of IDS is a function of which is in semi clock plot. What I see is that the graph looks something like this. That is, the current IDS drops logarithmically, exponentially drops as you reduce the voltage from VT all the way down to zero. And beyond the VT, you guys know the model. It's either a square law or a linear relationship. And so this whole thing, right? We are essentially modeling this in reality. We're just modeling this as a step function here. So if you look at all the models that you're using in this class, we are saying that at any gate voltage below VT, there is no current flowing. So we are grossly underestimating what is the power consumed by the power supply when the transistor is cut off, right? And so many a times again, that is something important, especially as you scale transistors, what happens is that the suppressor slope becomes worse and worse. So these things are important in current design. So when you do a full-fledged design, it's important to worry about what happens in sub-threshold. How do you ensure that the sub-threshold conduction is minimum? How do we ensure if we have to arrest for it and we need to have some switch transistors to arrest for it, etc. So there are a lot of techniques available in design to reduce the impact of sub-threshold. Again, those are things which we will not do in this class, again, to keep it simple. But as you take advanced classes, you know these concepts will come back in as you start to do design and start to make your design better and better, okay? So those are things I want you to remember. Again, we will continue to use the square law. So we will not diverge much from the square law. But these are things to keep in mind about the limitations of square law, the square law. And again, unfortunately, because there's an online semester, we're not doing cadence with you. But when you do cadence, you'll realize that, you know, the square law model is a good place to start. You know, it gives you a good starting point for similar, for design. But eventually design needs to go using the right spice models. We go and then develop further off the square law. The square law therefore gives a very good starting point for design. And then you go in and optimize it further. So in, unfortunately for you guys, this semester, you'll just learn the square law. You learn how to do design, how to find the starting point. If you guys are back next semester, then maybe in ADVD, we can think about how to, to teach you optimization further. Yeah. So let's now talk about large signal models, which is what we've been doing so far. So if I have an NMOS, right, connected in a circuit where we know that the N, this transistor is in linear region, right, that means we have the condition that VDS is much smaller than 2 times VGS minus VT. So if I have something like this, what does this mean? What does this transistor look like? in the output. When I have it in linear region where VDS is less than two times VG minus VT, what does this mean? What does, how do I model a transistor? A resistor. A resistor. Resistor, right. So the way you would model this, and this is known as the large signal model is, in the circuit, I'll replace the transistor with the circuit, which looks like this. Now, this is the source node. This is the gate node. Right? So I will replace 
this transistor with a circuit which looks like this resistor circuit whose R on is proportional to 1 by Vgs minus V. Right? And so when I want to solve them, if I have other resistors, other capacitors, etc., in the circuit, if I know, once I know what the region of operation the transistor is, then all I do is replace that transistor in that circuit with this model. And remember, this is a large signal model. We next talk about small signal models, and then the things will be different. Similarly, if the transistor now, if the transistor is in saturation. How would the model look like? So suppose I assume the transistor and saturation with PDS greater than or equal to VGS minus VT. How would the model look like? Yes, sir, ideal model would be like current source, ideal current source. Right. So the way you would again draw the model is this is your gate node. You have a common source node, right? And the ideal model would look like this. There is a current source. ID sat. Right? So this is your model for the transistor when there is no channel length modulation. In the case of channel length modulation, it is going to be an R not done. So this is how your transistor looks like. When you are thinking about the transistor and you want to solve circuits based on it. Now, why is this important? Now, this will be important because in this class, so again, remember, this ID sat is proportional to Vgs minus Vt, whole square, right, in our model. So we have a current voltage dependent current source, which is what we've been talking about. Why? So in this class, what we are interested in is we are going to be basically working on amplifiers or what are known as small signal models. So we will uh, first learn how to bias a circuit. And once we learn biasing, then we learn how a circuit works as an amplifier around the bias factor. So before we go any further, let's solve a problem uh, related to this. Um, so let's. So Sir, here Sorry. we are modeling as imperfect. Uh, are we taking into consideration the channel length? Right. Channel length modulation, then we'll model it as an imperfect current source, else we'll model it as a perfect current source. Okay, sir. Sir, could you, yeah. could you go to the previous slide? So, there's one thing I don't understand. Like, the variable over here is VDS, right? Where VGS, no? This is IDS VGS. No, no, not in this graph, in the transistor model that you have just done. So somebody wanted to look at this. Let me first finish. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Anand. No, so I was asking, in this circuit, the variable, the ones that are constant are VGS and we are varying VDS, or is it the reverse? No, that depends on how we are going to do the circuit. So this is just how we think about the transistor. Now, what varies? Depends on what the external circuit is. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Let's, uh, let's do a question. Uh, let me, so let's do an example. So I want you to plot I versus V1 in the circuit below. Assume lambda is equal to zero. So this is my circuit. So I want you to plot I versus I1 versus V1 for this one. That is, so basically you want to plot this graph. 
very simple circuit. How would the how would the relationship between I and B one look like? So for positive values of V one, I will be very close to zero. Okay, and so how would the graph look like? So what happens if V one is negative? So let's let me also make it easier for you. Let's assume V one is greater than equal to zero. So just plot me in the first quadrant. So when V one is negative, we can. Assume the v1 terminal to be zero and vdd is equal to minus. I mean the modulus of v1. No, so don't worry about that. I'm saying v1 is positive. Plot i1 versus v1 for me. How does the graph look like? Sir, in this is the body forward by us because it has a positive terminal voltage. The body and substrate are shorted. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Thank you. There's no current flowing due to accumulation. There's no current flowing because of accumulation. Where is accumulation? Because V one would be higher than V D D. So who says V one no is higher than V D D? Sir, if V one is zero, hmm. then we would have essentially the transistor is by like. Current will flow in the transistor. Mm -hmm. Eventually, as we raise V one, mm -hmm. it will go from being uh, in uh, saturation to being in the linear region, right? No. Since V one is a source voltage. No. Okay. Anybody else? So, how does the graph? Anybody want to comment on the shape? How does the graph look like? Is it? Is it? Is the current valid for all V one? Does the current become zero after some V one? Does the current Remain zero below some V one. How does the graph look like? Good. Okay. Let's let's start again. Below V one, huh? it will be para, uh, para quadratic. Below what? Below certain V one, so that V G S minus V T should be great, uh, less than V T. Okay. Uh, and, what and what happens beyond? Mm, then it should become linear. No, beyond I'm not so sure, but so, no. Let's let's you should you guys should be very sure about this. This is one of the simplest. We will give you much more complicated circuits. And so let's work together. Okay. First, let's identify the region of operation of the transistor. Let's assume that there is some V one applied at the source. So, what is the value of V G S for M one? So V D D. V D D minus V G S, right, between gate and source. So, what is right. the value of V G S? Uh, v D D minus V one. V D D minus V one. What is the value of V D S? So V D D minus V one. V D D minus V one. So if V G S is equal to V T, what region of operation is the transistor in? Saturation. So first thing is because V D S is always greater than V G S minus V T, right? Transistor is in saturation, right? So first thing therefore is that at no point is the transistor going to go into linear region, right? The transistor is always in saturation region. Now. At what point will the transistor go in? So the only other, so we know that the transistor in saturation for some value of V one. Now, as I keep increasing V one, what happens to this term V D D minus V one? So let's assume V D D is some five volts, right? So if I keep increasing V one, it starts V D D minus V one keeps dropping, right? And so. Eventually, what will happen when VGS falls below VT of the transistor? What happens to the transistor? Cut off. Right. So when VGS 
falls below vt of the transistor what happens to i i1 goes to zero zero and at what point does vgs become equal to vt vgs is equal to vt means vdd minus v1 is equal to vt implies v1 is equal to vdd minus vt right. so when i suppose i start at zero right current so now let's plot so we know current is in m1 is in saturation right so if m1 is in saturation i1 can be written as half kn prime w by l vgs minus vt the whole square vgs is nothing but vdd so vdd minus v1 minus vt the whole square right. so this equation is what will determine i1 versus v1 as long as the transistor is in saturation so the transistor goes into, into two states saturation and cutoff so we know that the transistor goes into cutoff at vdd minus vt so at all voltages beyond VDD minus VT, the current is a constant at zero. Now, therefore, when is the current going to be maximum? The current is going to be maximum when V1 is equal to zero, right? When V1 is equal to zero, the current is maximum. As V1 keeps increasing, this current keeps dropping quadratically. So the way your IV relationship is going to look like is going to look like something like this, where this is I max and I max is given by half kn prime w by l vdd minus vt the whole square right so this is how your relationship between i1 and v1 will look like right so anytime when you have to think about a circuit the first thing you have to think about is what is the region of operation of the transistor right figure out what are all the different regions so the first thing we always do in questions like this is figure out what the region of operation of the transistor is as the voltages vary, right? Once you identify those, then it's quickly a matter of just putting in these dumb, these expressions and finding the relationships, right? These are approximate graphs if you want to draw. Right? So again, what you see here is when you've connected this voltage to the source, right, of the transistor. So essentially, as you're pumping the source up, eventually the transistor is going to shut down. Any questions here? What if uh, V1 is less than zero? You tell me what happens when V1 is less than zero. It goes beyond IMAX. Mm, it will, no. What what happens to the value of IMAX? IMAX keeps increasing, right? So it's going to have a relationship like this. Right? Because as your V1 goes down, you're essentially increasing your VGS, right? Suppose your V1 becomes negative, suppose VDD is 5 volts and V1 becomes minus 1 volt, then your VGS actually becomes 6 volts, right? So its current should be higher than when V1 was 0. Right? So one way to increase VGS is make, make the source more and more negative. As you make the source negative, VGS in fact keeps going higher. Right? Any questions? We'll do a couple so of It is VDS is VDD minus V1, right? Okay. Ah, V1, yeah. So we'll do a couple more questions in the tutorial next week. But these are the this is an important concept you have to learn because if you don't, you have to first figure out how you're going to bias the circuit. So it's important to understand how to bias the circuit. So for that, you need to learn the relationships between the various currents and the voltages that have applied in the circuit. Uh, sir, could you explain the I equal to zero calculation? I equal to zero, okay. So as I, let's let's put some numbers into this, okay? That's, uh, that will make maybe your life easy. So let me... Let's say one board VT. And let's say uh, Kn prime W by L, whatever. Right? Let's say that is two milliamp. Right? Right? So these are my values, everyone. So if I, the first of all, 
all of you should be convinced that this transistor is always in saturation. So whenever you tie the gate and drain together, that is when you make BGD zero, when BGD is zero, then transistor is in saturation, right? And the reason why we call this the drain and not this the drain is because the voltage is higher at this end. So now when BGD is zero transistor saturation, so at any point, I1 is given by half Kn prime W by L, BGS minus Vt, the whole square, because I said lambda zero, right? Half Kn prime W by L is two milliamp, so half this becomes one milliamp. So one milliamp times BGS minus 1 the whole square or it is BGS minus 1 the whole square right now what is BGS this is gate this is source this is drain right so BGS is given by BG minus VS right VG is nothing but 5 volt and VS is nothing but V1 right so BGS is 5 minus V1 Right. And so therefore your I1 is written as 5 minus V1 minus 1 the whole square or 4 minus V1 the whole square. So therefore you see that I1 reduces as V1 increases and it reduces in a parabolic fashion. Right. So if I plot I1 versus V1, it's going to do this. Right. Now the question is that is the transistor always in saturation? No, the transistor gets out of saturation when, so when VGS becomes equal to one volt or equal to VP, right? anything below that point, the transistor is in cutoff. And when transistor is in cutoff, then transistor is in cutoff. And what does the cutoff mean? Cutoff means that I is equal to zero, right? So when the transistor goes into cutoff, then the current flowing through the transistor goes to zero. And when does the transistor go into cutoff? The transistor goes into cutoff and VGS is one volt. What is VGS? VGS is phi minus V1. And that should be equal to one volt. Implies when V1 is equal to four volts, then transistor is in cutoff. Right. So for any voltage, when V1 is any voltage equal to or greater than 4 volts, then VGS becomes less than 1 volt. And since 1 volt is your VT, that essentially means the transistor is cut off. So there's no current flowing through the circuit when V1 is greater than 4 volts. Right? And so essentially what that means is that this current is going to be parabolic till it hits the 4 volt. And at that point, the model changes and it becomes a pure zero current. Right. And so now if I look at the value, what is the value at V1 equal to zero? It is 16 milliamp. Right. So 16 milliamp falls to zero milliamp within a span of four volt voltage. Is that clear now? Yes, sir. Okay. So um Let's, uh, I was hoping to start small signal modeling. Uh, let's, uh, let me take a couple of minutes and let me just get you started on thinking about small signal. All right. So what are we going to do in this class? So in this class, as I told you, we're going to worry about amplifiers. Right? And so what are we doing in amplifiers is we always have a small signal, which is an AC signal. So in other words, we'll have say a one millivolt or a 10 millivolt signal and we want to amplify that signal. So many a times at any voltage in the, at any point in the circuit, you will have a DC voltage and you'll have a small signal AC voltage in the signal, uh, in the circuit, right? And we are interested in understanding how this small signal moves through the circuit. So eventually we want to design an amplifier. We want to track this small signal as it looks at, as we look at the various nodes in the circuit. And hence we want to see eventually if we can amplify the signal. Right? So many a times therefore in small signal, we have to worry about a small variation on top of a DC voltage. For example, suppose 
if I plot this voltage, I mean, you say, for example, I have a node whose DC voltage is one volt. Right? So as a function of time, how does, and suppose I have a 10 millivolt sign signal riding on it. So essentially, my signal that is going to look in reality in the circuit is going to be a one volt signal with a 10 millivolt signal riding on it. So this is nothing but one volt plus 10 millivolt sin omega t, right? So what is the, if if that is going to be some voltage V1, what is the maximum value of V1? V1 varies essentially between 1.01 and 0.99 volts, right? Now, what we are interested in, not so much. So once this one volt is fine. Now, suppose I increase the, something happens in the circuit and I'm able to increase the AC voltage to 20 millivolts, right? So what I'm interested there, V1 will then become 1.02 to 0.98. Right? So what I'm going to be interested in is not necessarily the DC voltage, right? But rather I want to see how the AC voltage moves through the circuit. So in that case, we're going to talk about not only the large signal model of the amplifier, we're going to talk about small signal models of the transistors. That is, if you think about a transistor which is biased, say I've biased it with some VDS, with some VGS, right? and some IDS is flowing through. Now, suppose I apply a small signal on the gate voltage in addition to this DC voltage. I'm interested to know how does the small signal affect the current that is going through the transistor and how does it affect the output voltage of the transistor, right? So the large signal model relates IDS as a function of VGS and VDS. Remember, I'm doing all these with capital letters and capital subscripts, right? So this is the DC model. Right, or the large signal model. What we are now going to develop in the next class is I'm going to develop this IDS, which is going to be another function of VGS and VDS. So here I'm going to develop a model where I just want to look at the AC parts of what is happening around the transistor. And this is known as the small signal model. And what we'll find is that the small signal model is nothing but a linearizing this large signal around the bias point. Okay. So what we do is this. So what we're doing is a small signal model linearizes the circuit around a bias point. So we'd be interested in two things, therefore, the model therefore becomes a function of the bias point. And this is basically the crux of design in trying to understand how we're going to bias the circuit and then based on where you're going to bias, the circuit properties are going to change. So not only you worry about the transistor sizes, the voltage sources and all that you're applying, you also have to worry about how are you biasing the circuit. So we'll, we'll spend a lot of time in this class also talking about biasing circuits. How do we bias trans? How do you bias these circuits? How do you bias these amplifiers so as to get the required gain or the required properties of the amplifier? Okay. And this is why, again, you know, in your entire course structure, we spend a lot of time talking about, in fact, this semester, all you guys will be talking about is LTI systems, linear time invariant systems, right? across control systems, across signal systems, and microtronic circuits. And linearization is a very important concept. Unfortunately, linearization is about which we can formalize a lot of design and formalize a lot of theory. Anything beyond linear becomes hard to formalize and do back of the envelope calculations. So hence, you'll see that in your code structure, in general, when we model things around us, we, we limit ourselves to linear models just because they're easy and they give a good starting point for us to understand what's happening around and to replicate it, which is the whole point of engineering. Okay, so I'll stop here. We'll start with small signal model on the in the Monday's class, and then we will look at what is a bias point, how does an amplifier look like. Okay, so. so
Yeah, like, I understand what you mean when you say large signal. And, like the amplitude is large, but how does it affect why you have different models? We'll, we'll talk about it. Wait. Give it a few more classes. So can you show the first slide? Also, sir, like uh, I don't understand. Uh, this IDS in a DC model is a function of capital VGS comma capital VDS. You're assuming them to be constant DC 